podcast and where, we, where it gets its name. So quickly to address that, um, it's a play off of the notion that we're all just six degrees of separation from knowing every person on the planet. And for those of us, those of us that have been around smart manufacturing uh, or manufacturing in general for a long time, um, I believe that the most important way for us to connect and get the information we need to make smart man manufacturing work for us is by connecting with as many people, as many knowledgeable people with practical experience as possible. So we will spend the next 20 minutes um, with one of those uh, people and um, your microphones will be muted throughout the, uh, the, uh, the webcast. There is a Q&A button that's available to you in your panel. Uh, so feel free at any time that you have any questions for me or for Jim uh, to go ahead and submit those questions. Or if you have questions after the event, go ahead and submit them uh, to me by email, uh, mike.yost at sesame.org, as you can see on the screen. If you're not familiar with the uh, Zoom platform that we're using here, um, you have different options for the, the video um, uh, thumbnails that are uh, on the screen. Uh, so you can click on those if you don't like the way that they are presented on your screen. Just click on them and you'll have a few options to make them bigger or smaller or move them around as you would like. Uh, just one final point, um, uh, the, the webinar is being recorded uh, and it will be posted online. And uh, so we encourage everybody to uh, watch online if you uh, haven't seen any of the previous ones. And uh, we will continue the discussions, the dialogue there. So with that, I would like to um, ask Jim Davis if he would uh, join his, turn his microphone on on his video on and, and join me here as I give just a brief uh, background here on, on Jim. As you can see from the bio slide here, um, Jim is uh, uh, a veteran of the smart manufacturing space. Many people in manufacturing uh, consider Jim to be one of the founding fathers of smart manufacturing. Uh, you can see his credentials there. I mentioned his title already. I should also mention that he is the principal investigator um, and the principal CIO advisor for the, the Institute, the Sesame Institute. Um, and uh, rather than reading all of, of Jim's accomplishments there, I'm, I'm gonna just uh, read one thing from uh, an award that the National Association of Manufacturers, uh, Manufacturing Leadership Council just bestowed upon Jim uh, this year, um, their Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, and they did so in a release noting that Jim Davis believes a deeper grasp of data context, better ways to combat complexity, and a more broadly embraced industrial culture of collaboration and innovation are essential to manufacturing's future. Uh, I couldn't think of anybody that's more deserving of um, uh, that Lifetime Achievement Award. So Jim, thank you very much for being here and joining us. And uh, I guess with that as the background, I would uh, like to welcome you and ask you what we ask everybody to start this off is what does smart manufacturing look like to you? All right, uh, Mike, thanks. Didn't know you were gonna say that. So uh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, appreciate a little bit of introduction there. Um, I was just talking to Mike before we started. This is actually, from my perspective, a pretty timely uh, conversation. Um, uh, from my perspective or historical perspective, we've been trying to define smart manufacturing in a way that makes sense for manufacturers, but actually at the same time reflects what manufacturing needs it to say or needs it to be doing uh, going forward. Uh, when we first started this, it was a, a term that no one was using. That's now become a term that everyone's using and the continue, continued uh, work to define it actually is, is really quite important. Uh, from my perspective, uh, given this 15-minute uh, uh, little presentation, this is 15 years and 15 minutes. Uh, just a real quick historical perspective. Uh, smart manufacturing, from my perspective, was first used in 2006, and we defined it at that time in terms of 10 behaviors that uh, industry talked about would make up smart manufacturing. If you go to 2010, uh, Sujit Chen and I published an article in the uh, New Yorker uh, and actually defined it through a graphic uh, as the intersection of plant-wide optimization. Um, Got to remember the words here. It's been too many years. Plant-wide optimization, uh, agile demand-driven uh, supply chain, and sustainable production, but the, in, in, uh, the intersection of all three of those. In both cases, those uh, behaviors and that intersection have actually stood the test of time. If I fast move now 
to two, around 2015 when we were writing the application for SESME. And Mike, if you can go to the slide. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and for those of you who may just be on the phone, I'll, I'll read some of this. In, in the application, we actually defined uh, the vision of smart manufacturing with a simple statement of smart manufacturing is manufacturing in 2030. We actually spent quite a bit of time on that one, uh, and Jim Wetzel was actually quite instrumental. Uh, but basically the point is, is that uh, this should become so ubiquitous, so pervasive, what we mean by smart manufacturing, that it actually disappears and becomes the norm over the next several years. So that's actually become kind of a mantra for uh, SESME moving forward. But if I go back to where we are today, um, the when I talk with industry, and I'm actually at this point where I've done well over 50 or 60 deep dives with all of you in terms of actual uh, problems, actual solutions, how one actually puts this together. And the pattern of these have, has stabilized. And uh, you've heard quite a bit uh, through the SESME kinds of discussions. But what has become very, very evident to me is there's a series of properties that seem to stand out and are I use the word stabilize because everyone across industries, across different problems are talking about these as I can do these now or I need to work towards these in the near future going forward. So this is what I'm actually showing on this, uh, on this slide. Um, the SESME Technology Roadmap, which we did in 2017, actually brought out integrated uh, elements, uh, business, technology, practice, and workforce. And that's actually held true with, when I say stabilized properties, reflecting industry, uh, these are all integrated going forward. And so what's in the black and then the, uh, the text underneath, which I will read, uh, actually become properties, you know, that, those which sort of gather everything together and then some sub-considerations going forward. But if I go through these quickly and then we can open it up for a dialogue on the business side, um, I use the term macro, micro. And what this really means is as we look at the benefits of smart manufacturing in terms of demand dynamics, uh, new growth markets with uh, more precision, more value add products, smaller lots, all of these sorts of business objectives, the real value of smart manufacturing comes in the intersection of macro at a supplier value chain level of working with uh, an optimized enterprise and combining that with what I call the micro side, which is the precision with a process or a machine and really deeply understanding in a much, much better way the interaction between the product and that process and machine using the sensors and models to do so. But if you do each of these independently, it's not really smart manufacturing. If you integrate macro and micro together, you really start seeing the true benefits of smart manufacturing uh, from a benefit standpoint. If I move to the next one, which is under the technology area, uh, I put this term effortless trusted data and model. So effortless also, uh, has to uh, ultimately go under quotation marks. But essentially right. what we're saying here is that uh, after 40 years of IT in the industry, we've kind of burdened ourselves with the physical side of the uh, manufacturing, and rightly so, and with the functional side, and then we tack on the data and the modeling after that. And we've been building that sort of gradually. And where smart manufacturing has gotten to is, let's unburden how we're using data from the physical side and let's start thinking about it as a data asset in its own right, use the term data centricity. Uh, everyone talks about it, the heavy lift is still contextualized data. So how do you actually do the heavy lift with contextualized data? And what becomes really important is how can you actually use the, uh, the work that has been with past contextualized data and not reinvent the contextualization each time going forward. That's kind of a local issue, but the methods and tools and so forth to uh, take that one forward. And then the last one, secure data partnerships. If we actually are going to do true collaborative business agreement kinds of activities in the value chain or supply chain sense, we'd better be able to ha be able to share the data in an appropriate way. So this one is really just going after much greater granularity to deal with business agreements that will have to reflect selectivity of the data, who gets the data, uh, the security of the data, and how that data is used and executed in the format going forward. And that's actually become quite an important element, uh, or shall we say property going forward. Um, if I move over to the next one, there's the word practice. Now I use the word practice 
uh, to mean how do you bring the business, the technology, the workforce, the organization, the culture, the policies, uh, all of the elements that come to play to actually implement this uh, and use the word practice to represent that entire comprehensive mix of things that need to happen you know, to, to literally implement and have it have impact. But one of the things, one of the practices that is particularly important here, I just simply use the term re reusability at scale. And one of the key aspects that's really grown the past uh, five to six years out of smart manufacturing is that we have to kind of get out of this mode of reinventing the infrastructure, reinventing the contextualized data every time we put another system in. And the way to get at that is, is actually not the technology, but it actually goes after the intellectual property. Uh, there's quite a bit of discussion now which has uh, grown fairly recently about how to unburden the intellectual property. There's aspects of the intellectual property which you absolutely need to protect, but there's some aspects which actually are huge advantages if we can actually make those move forward into more, a more usable uh, uh, way of building these systems out. If you're going to relax intellectual property just a bit, uh, you also need to unburden, unburden the operational technology. Almost every single thing we see from a business standpoint and a benefit standpoint is that you're bringing operational technology, which means data about the physical operation, about the behavior, about the process, and you're bringing it together with the information technology. And if you keep those two separate, you, you just can't solve the problems. But if you bring, bring the two together, the IT can solve some of the OT problems that we're facing. The OT actually can solve some of the IT problems that we're facing. Thinking about them together actually prevents a much, much high, more highly synergistic solution, security being one that's really front and center. And then the last one under practice is what I call collaborative return on investment. If we continue to do return on investment the old way, which is try to predict what the whole value is, take a long time to design this out, and then put forward how I'm going to build a solution, you'll never get there with the data. What you really need to do is think more about what's a line of sight benefit, start small, get towards that benefit, and then let the data and the understanding work for you, and then build out the next step and the next step. So collaborative ROI actually takes on much more of a development operations kind of approach to working with data and then deriving the benefits. And then the very last one, and, and I'll uh, get this back into a dialogue, uh, workforce is absolutely critical in all of this. And one of the things I argue is not just training a few people, it's actually a cultural change. Uh, many people need to be uh, uh, brought up to speed with a whole different range of ways to work with data, understanding how data will work. Security actually depends on people being uh, security savvy going forward. But what's really being said here is the workforce itself is, needs to be completely integrated with smart manufacturing, all the way from smart workers in the loop to the smart workers working with data, uh, to the smart workers are helping put these systems together, build the machines, uh, provide the solutions. All of these things require uh, a, a, a much, call it a next level of data practice and secu security savviness in how smart manufacturing goes forward. And if we do this, we get to this, uh, call it uh, somewhat of a holy grail, but I think it's reachable. I call it uh, R&D at scale. But if we start working with the data, start working with reusability, build out the culture, you actually start building out data about manufacturing, data about applications, data about how applications were uh, configured, used. Uh, you can get into quantitative aspects. Uh, Jet Propulsion Lab has actually used this extensively uh, over many, many Mars missions, or I should say space missions. They keep accumulating the data that they've used across all of these, and they use this to build up a much more comprehensive practice across all of these for the next space mission going forward. I don't see any reason why smart manufacturing and the manufacturing industry can't do something in a similar way. But uh, these are properties that have come through uh, discussions with you, the manufacturers and the solution providers, the machine builders, stakeholders, universities, and uh, uh, they are not mine. They are a reflection of what I'm hearing across many, many uh, discussions with all of you. So, Mike, let me stop there and let's uh, go back to a dialogue. Yes. 
No, that, that's fantastic. Like you said, Jim, um, you know, 15 years and 15 minutes uh, is, is a lot to ask. And, um, you know, what you've represented here shows a number of things. I, it, it, it reflects the fact that um, while there, um, there may be people focused on particular areas, um, uh, it's such a broad, um, manufacturing is such a broad domain. And um, I think it's very good for people to hear the fact that there are thinkers like yourself and, and, and leaders uh, like yourself who are involved in thinking things, not only at the micro level, but also at the macro level. Um, and, and you talk about uh, things like secure data partnerships and, and business contractual relationships um, and um, how important that is. Because I know in practice, as we've seen throughout the years, um, it's hard enough to get departments or people inside of a, of a manufacturing operation to trust sharing data across departmental boundaries uh, for potential implications of what that means to them and their job and their performance, um, let alone when we start to have um, you know, business contracts that are driven by data ownership and, and uh, data sharing and, and things like that. So um, I guess just fr from your perspective, um, don't want to take you back in the past, um, but I guess, um, certainly see the cultural challenges, the operational challenges, um, you see specific barriers that have, have kept us um, grounded um, or, or are there any particular challenges or barriers that stand out as, as larger challenges for us than, than any others here? The, on the barrier side, I, I try to sum it up uh, or sum you know, the, the discussions up. Uh, probably the first one is risk uh, and uh, how can I get started and how can I manage the risk in the most appropriate way? Those who are getting started are managing the risk, and uh, but they're actually having a very active discussion about risk and how do I take this forward? So I'm the first one to say that uh, you have to be careful with risk and you have to manage it, but you also have to work through it. Uh, second one I would say, uh, which I mentioned, is intellectual property. Uh, you know, the current state uh, our viewpoint on intellectual property is that anything about the product, anything about the process uh, needs to be locked down. The moment that position is taken, you actually start putting a large barrier uh, to smart manufacturing. And that's why I say we have to start thinking about, not, it's not about giving up intellectual property, it's relaxing what is really intellectual property, where our values with intellectual property being thought about uh, in a different way. Um, Cybersecurity is a third one. Uh, it's always been there. Uh, it's subtle, uh, but over the past few years, uh, it's actually come to the forefront in very significant ways. Uh, I basically see that the U.S. industry, uh, for the most part, hasn't really recognized uh, how big of a potential issue this is. But at the same time, cybersecurity is still a barrier to even taking first steps uh, uh, moving forward. So I'm, I'm basically describing it's much more of a cultural uh, sort of uh, business sorts of things that are the barriers, not the technology or not moving forward. And then obviously the workforce side of these things, uh, everyone is talking about uh, the need for people who can tackle and use and use these kinds of things appropriately. We're way behind on that. And the faster and the better we can actually deal with the workforce, that perhaps is even the most immediate key to moving this forward. Right now it's a barrier. Yeah, and, and I and I think um, again, as represented by the fact that there are people like yourself and like the institute, and like many others, that are working as part of an ecosystem to look uh, at the the immediate challenges as well as 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 the long term challenges. I also see a lot of the, um, um, sort of the as you mentioned, the relaxing or the sort of cultural things shifting as you have um, you know digital natives and you have. The younger generation that's used to collaborating, used to sharing uh, all the time, not as many concerns as far as um, sharing information. And so I think we'll see some of those things from a cultural perspective shift as well, because to your point, when smart manufacturing is manufacturing, I think that the, the, the younger generation, the, um, the folks that are um, citizen technologists or digital natives, uh, they, will, they will help um, have, have fewer cultural uh, acceptance issues with things like that, which will help us as well. So, um, and we knew coming into this gym that time was going to fly. And so um, uh, it, it is, we are, we are um, at the end of our time together. And so uh, as is normal practice, I wanted to uh, sort of give you the opportunity to, to take us out here and I'll, I'll throw the question back to you and uh, ask you 
uh, to take us out. I know you created another slide, which I will shift to, but if you're going to give the audience one, one takeaway here or, or one uh, snippet um, for them to take away of, of what smart manufacturing looks like to you, what would you say? Um, and I'll go off, uh, off uh, script a little bit here. I, uh, for those of you who can actually see the screen, I wanted to show you uh, that the four properties or the four property categories that I mentioned uh, are actually coming from you. And uh, over the past four or five years, every time we did a deep dive uh, into a solution uh, and how one would think about smart manufacturing within an individual company and a solution, uh, we did an economic analysis, we did uh, basically an operations analysis, and we did a real-time data and modeling analysis. And what you can see here, and I'm not going to go through it, is a whole pattern that basically reflects how this micro-macro piece that I was talking about uh, moving from precision to line operation to supply chain, and then this whole business about the data and modeling and a whole set of things about how do I deal with property, sensing, optimization, prediction, and analysis control, and how do I do it in a more easy way. And the last point I'll, I will leave you with is uh, um, this is where these terms productivity, precision, performance come from. Uh, we see smart manufacturing invariably involving these forms of data and modeling. Uh, the economic potential is very high in the last box, and I would be remiss if I didn't end by saying this is about small, medium, and large companies. There are significant differences among all three, but all three are actually critical uh, to all of this, and we actually have to approach how we do this in very different ways for each of those groupings of companies because they all need to integrate and work together to make all of this work. If we keep those apart, this doesn't work. Smart manufacturing doesn't reach its full potential either. So let me stop there, and I hope there's a takeaway with at least four categories of properties. <laughs> well, excellent, Jim. Truly, truly appreciate it. Um, and uh, so we will we'll let everybody get on with their day. Um, thank you again, Jim. I encourage anybody to uh, continue to engage with us, to go ahead and email me if you have questions, if you have specific topics that you'd like to talk about, or if you'd like to sign up to be a guest yourself or recommend somebody to be a guest. Um, we do these uh, webcasts the second and fourth uh, Wednesday of every month at the same time. So on uh, October 23rd, I invite you to come back and uh, as we ask uh, Doug Lawson, who's the CEO of a solution provider company called Think IQ, what smart manufacturing looks like to him. So thank you very much again. Uh, have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.